was that a wire in the door crack? However, right as I noticed that detail. Oh, electricity this time. I felt a deep shock to my back. A taser? Before I could open the door more than a crack, I collapsed to the ground. What, what was this? As my vision began to fade, I looked up trying to see who my attacker was. I expected to see Brian, smirking, gloating that he had lured me into his trap. But instead, I found myself staring at an entirely separate face. An unexpected face. What are you doing here? That's all I could get out before passing out. What the hell do you mean I'm on hiatus? Look, I'm perfectly fine to continue working. It's already been well over a week since the incident, and in case you didn't know, I wasn't even injured or anything. I'm sure this is just you trying to be considerate, but believe me, getting back to work would put my mind at ease more than anything at this point. I've already rested just fine, thank you. But what do you mean I've been compromised with personal bias? Prosecutors have always had personal biases. Everyone has personal biases. It doesn't mean I can't do my damn job. Therapy? Okay, I think you're not being objective right now. They get it, I'll take a break. We'll talk later. Thank you, thank you. You're really too kind. I still have some time, yes? Great, awesome. How about we do some questions? Anyone got anything they want to ask me? Yes, you in the back, in the red cardigan. How do I feel towards Brian when all's said and done? Hmm, that's, uh, that's a real tough one, isn't it? To be clear, I'm just going to be talking from my own perspective on all of this. On the one hand, I think the little pipsqueak was pretty weak. I mean, I get being angry about injustice, but killing himself in that explosion when all was said and done? That's a coward's way out. If you had the conviction to set everything else up, have the conviction to see things through. But that's just my opinion on him. My feelings towards him. A bit of pity, I guess. Seems like he's been dealt a rough hand. To be honest, I kind of feel a bit thankful that he let me go through such a crazy experience. I'm sensing some of you are turning against me now. Am I supposed to be angry at him or something? Other than him, it's not like anybody got injured. Yes, I'm aware of the people who are still missing. Jeez, did you hear Bowen at the press conference earlier today? That was real brutal. I'm telling you, it's a sorry thing. Just because a nut job believes something with a ton of conviction doesn't make that belief the least bit justified. And yet, since the incident, there's been a number of people questioning if Brian could have been right. I mean, how do you get off honoring a complete psycho's will? Anyways, Bowen was certainly prepared for that whole mess. After dropping all that evidence, any disruptive rumors are sure to wash away. But, uh, between you and me, wasn't some of that evidence, you know, not exactly... Hey, hey, of course I'm not questioning Bowen at all. Aaron Morris is clearly guilty. The chief was just making that abundantly clear in a way that he saw fit. You're right, there's nothing to look into here. Anyways, it looks like he wants to comp completely bury the case. I know he always kept an eye on that thing, wondering if new leads might show up. Not because he expected any, just because it was, you know, his brother who died and all. But now the state has to double down on the conviction unless we want a whole bunch of unrest which means bolstering the truth as much as possible and getting rid of disruptions to that narrative. Hey man, could we talk in private after this shift? Yes, mum, like I said before, I was just a victim in all of this. I didn't have any involvement or anything. No, I don't know why I was targeted then. I think it's related to what happened with my previous boss, Amadeus. You're right, mum, Amadeus was very sweet. It is a shame what happened to him, and it's a shame that Aaron's selfishness led to his son also falling into... You're right, Brian doesn't have any excuse. He's a really bad kid. But he's gone now, and I'm safe, and there really isn't anything to worry about anymore. Hey, Mum, I need to get back to work. I love you. Yes, I was involved in the XXXX high school incident. What of it? No, really, it was incredible. You should have seen it. Everybody was completely freaking out, their faces flushed. I swear they were moments from completely collapsing into anarchy, brandishing weapons and killing each other in a frenzy. They were already scheming about how they would be the ones to survive this horrid game. However, I wasn't going to accept any victims, not on my watch. All my brain particles were spent analysing the situation, searching for a way to save the poor victims, consigned with the rogue personality. It seemed like an impossible task because, of course, it was meant to be. 
but then in a flash of inspiration I realized it. If we could combine two of the major trinkets that we had already found, we would be able to ensure that everybody could get out alive. The moment I pointed out the loophole, everybody just broke out into applause. Really, you had to be there. It was like I was really in one of my past movies. Oh, and speaking of movies, I've already licensed the rights to this story, so look out for my next flick. It's sure to be a smash hit. Yes, yes, I'm aware that I was responsible for counselling the accused. Why am I calling him the accused? The state has yet to officially make the case against him, yet. Formally, it may be, I prefer the mantra innocent until proven guilty. Formality, it may be. At any rate, this whole incident naturally falls to some extent on me for not being able to give him the counselling required. I am willing to face repercussions for my hand in not preventing this tragedy. However, I'd like to make my position clear. Ryan was an incredibly disturbed individual. True, trauma accounts for some of it, but only some of it. There was a much deeper darkness in him. I recommended increased help to his mother several times, but it was always ignored. For some reason, she seemed to believe these gestures of mine were made in pursuit of financial gain, instead of concern for the boy. And I noted to her that he had begun to skip our sessions. I do not wish to lay any more suffering on her doorstep at this time. She has already been overwrought with grief. However, I think that some responsibility for this falls on Brian's actual guardian. Still, I failed to do my job and people got hurt. I will take responsibility. No, it's, it's insane. I've never been blowing up to this extent. The series of articles I published on the incident have become to go the go-to thing to read when you want to know what happened. I've been getting booked for so many different podcasters' appearances and since I've been plugging non-stop, that means increased viewership on all my other projects. I hate to say it, but being kidnapped for that game might have been one of the best things that happened to me. Sure, there's been some side effects from going through that experience, like paranoia, panic attacks, insomnia, and depression, but who cares, I had all of that beforehand anyways. So yeah, this is my one chance to really grip a hold of the public consciousness. If I ride this out properly, I can be set for life. The next steps are to recover ride and all this hype. How to do it? How to do it? Obviously, I've got to work on some sort of video series, doing a deep dive into it. I've also been toying with the idea of writing an op-ed in defense of Brian. This incident happening in the first place is also a pretty scathing indictment of a bunch of different systems that we have in place, so I can spin a few different articles on who's at fault for this whole thing. Hmm, you think I'm too young to publish a memoir? News surrounding the incident that took place at XXXX High School is still incoming as we get more information surrounding the incident. There are many unsolved mysteries with the whole event. Perhaps the biggest remaining question mark is the location of four of the victims, abducted by the mastermind Brian Morris. Other victims of the incident claim, excuse me, claim that all four missing victims were in fact alive at the end of the purported death game. However, at present, it appears as though the ex-cop and current bartender Jamie Wilbert stole a nearby car from the scene and kidnapped the young law student, a local gang leader and an older teacher. The motivation for such an act is incredibly unclear. This combined with purported interactions between Brian Morris and Mr. Wilbert before the incident have led some to speculate that the ex-cop may have been a co-conspirator in the kidnappings. However, at this point in time, such rumours are mere speculation. More importantly, the police are still eagerly searching for any signs of any of the four missing persons. And many are concerned about the possibility that the victims, despite escaping the death game, were unable to escape death. Ugh, my head hurt. I had not been getting enough sleep. I don't know how I could have been. Sure, my captor had been generous enough to provide me with a mattress and a blanket to help me sleep. But those few inches between me and the concrete floor did little. More to the point, the collar around my neck was really uncomfortable to sleep in, especially since it was connected to a chain. I mean, I get why I was forced to wear it, but still. It sucked. Oh, and there was the whole currently being kidnapped thing. That certainly didn't help with my stress levels. Snake, I swear to fucking Christ, if you walk into my area one more time, I'm going to strangle you when you sleep. Painting needs inspiration. When I'm inspired, I wonder. The only thing you're inspiring is my urge to beat the shit out of you. My roommates also left a lot to be desired. Could you please keep it down? Are you really trying to go back to sleep? 
the light on and everything. Now I'm just getting sick of you two. Your arguments are incessant and I'm sick of it. Why can't you two just behave? I don't know if I deserve much blame in all of this. If I recall, the majority of the altercations have come from Dragon attacking me for something rather benign. Yeah, but you're provoking her. Who, me? I'd never. You know exactly what you're doing. If I've learned anything over these past few days, it's that you're actually just as childish as she is. Childish? Who the fuck are you calling childish? I don't have time for this. Correction, you have nothing but time for this. And that's the problem, isn't it? It was at this point that our captain decided to make his entrance, carrying a tray of food and drinks. I brought breakfast. Silence filled the room. A thank you might be nice. Fuck you, you psychopath. You kidnapped us. Maybe, but this and that are separate things. So, do you want to have breakfast or not? Is our meal contingent on showing you respect by thanking you? It'd be dickish if that was the case, wouldn't it? It would. And I suppose not. In that case, I'll also refrain. Gotcha. Mouse? Thank you for the meal, dog. No problem. Mouse! You fucking traitor strike-breaking blackleg. We're supposed to be a united front. United front doesn't have nearly as much infighting as this. And besides, a united front against who? Dog, obviously. Why, I need a full united front to be taken down. How flattering. If Dragon was expecting me to work up a lot of anger at Dog, she'd be disappointed. I was pretty pissed at him, no doubt. But all things considered, he'd been a pretty reasonable host to his captives. He'd listened to most of the requests asked of him, and did his best to keep us occupied with books and painting supplies and whatnot. He even hosted daily game nights, which was slightly surreal. And besides, I could see where he was coming from with all of this. A lot more than I could with Brian, at any rate. So, Dick, anything change? Are you gonna let us out yet? If I do, are you going to storm out into the open? Of oh, fucking course I am! What, do you want me to live in your stupid basement forever? In that case, I'm afraid you have to stay here. Trust me, it's for your own good. How can you say that shit with a straight face when you're imprisoning us? Well, I also saved you free, so I think it kinda evens out. I must say, dog, I'm surprised that we are still here. Presumably the police should be looking for us, no? If they are. But I doubt they'll find us here. I got a lot of good connections from working as a cop and a bartender. This one's pretty low-key, pretty reliable. We could hide out here for over a month. How exciting. Dog, I'm trying to be understanding. I still don't understand everything. I don't get why you're doing all of this. Could you try to explain it all clearly? Again with this, Dog sighed. Well, I suppose keeping it from you ain't gonna do much good at this point. If I'm going to be keeping you guys here without your consent, least I could do is give you the full layout of things. Else I'd be a total scum, you know? Trust me, you already are. Ouch, that might be fair. Anyways, if you really want to understand, I'm gonna have to bore you with the whole story, so strap in, folks. How exciting. Looking forward to it. You two shut up. They were honestly a lot more similar than, similar than Evo would care to admit. Alright, so, you all already know that I used to be a cop, yeah? You might not believe it, but I was a pretty good one as well. I totally believe that. The current chief of police, uh, Oliver Bowen, I came up with that guy. He was a really good friend. That point's important for why I haven't killed a guy on my own at this point. It was a sad and thankless job that did a number on my soul, but I did it all the same. Eventually, enough was enough for me. The job was too cruel, too thankless, too draining. Plus, the force was slowly getting corrupt. Slowly? Alright, well, you could argue that the force has never been the shining example of justice it was meant to be, but what I'm talking about is a lot more substantive, a substantive degradation. I also knew it was not in spite of Oliver becoming the chief of police, but because of them. I tried to get a straight answer from him what it was all about, but that was a failed endeavour. At some point, it just wasn't worth it. So I quit, became a bartender, yada yada yada. And that was what, and that was that, until the case where Aaron Morris killed Amadeus Bowen, Oliver's brother. Due to odd circumstances, I ended up getting involved in the case. I gave important testimony at trial. When Morris was sentenced, I thought that was that. Until Oliver came to my bar late one night, a wreck. Well, he hadn't been great ever since his brother's death, but he was. 
He was different. I was familiar with the look of desperation in his eyes. I'd seen it in criminals before. After a bit of pressing and a number of drinks, he finally spilled. I honestly couldn't tell you why he told me the truth that night. Enough stress has piled up on him. He had no one to talk to, had to talk about it to. I guess he just needed to confess. Whatever the case, he told me what was actually up with the horse. Apparently his brother Amadeus, the jackass, had been filling his head with a bunch of stupid ideas. About how he'd have better control of the police and ergo the city if he got dirt on his subordinates. So that's what Oliver did. He intentionally created situations where he could get blackmail material on the people he employed and he filled a whole file full of this stuff. Pretty scummy shit, but not as scummy as what his brother then did to him. Amadeus got Oliver on tape confessing to the little blackmail scheme, thus creating a blackmail leverage over him. Imagine being screwed over by your own brother. That's gotta make Thanksgiving's award awkward, sorry. Using the leverage, Amadeus got Oliver to hand over all the material he had already collected on his subordinates. But at this point, Amadeus had his thumb over the entire force. But turns out that's far from all he had control over. See, this little blackmail idea from Amadeus wasn't just a spur of the moment thing. Amadeus had been creating his own little folder for quite some time. Being the CEO of an entertainment company, he had plenty of time to meet with big names, powerful people. Slowly and methodically, Amadeus had been dragging more and more people into his web. I don't know the specifics of how he did it, but suffice it to say, Amadeus was doing some real sketchy shit. But it had been working for him. At this point, he had pretty much the whole city of Hightower under his influence in some way or another. He was in complete control, and then he ended up dying. That's karma for you, I suppose. When Oliver told all this to me, I didn't know what to say. Mostly I just wanted to punch him, but that wasn't going to be effective at accomplishing anything, so instead I asked him something. By Oliver's description, Amadeus was pretty much the actual devil. So why was he so bothered by his death? Instead of answering my question, he took out a knife. A golden, intricate knife. Is that? Yes, it's the knife I showed you the other day. As fate would have it, Oliver would end up leaving the knife with me by the end of the night as a gift. But originally, Oliver was gifted that knife by his late father. Oliver's dad was a craftsman, and at some point he had gifted two identical knives to his two sons, Amadeus and Oliver. Oliver never thought much of it, but Amadeus loved it. Supposedly, Amadeus had always been a lot closer with his father than Oliver. A funny thing about these knives is that they're outfitted with a small little hidey hole. You wouldn't know it just looking at the knife, but like I showed you the other day, it's good for hiding, for holding something small. Amadeus kept the knife on his person at all times as a sort of keepsake. And he also kept a special USB flash drive on him at all times, a flash drive containing the totality of his work. His golden gun, his blackmail portfolio, three guesses as to where he hid it. In the knife's hidey hole? Bingo. Mouse gets it in one. Makes sense, really. You keep one thing on you all the time, you keep another thing on you all the time. One thing has a slot to hide something the size of the other thing. Kind inevitable. But see, here's the thing. Something happened that Amadeus Bowen didn't account for. He was killed. And something happened that Oliver Bowen didn't account for either. That knife went missing from the crime scene. What? I don't recall hearing about this detail. Yeah, obviously this wasn't a problem Oliver was eager to bring up to the public. No matter how much he looked, he couldn't find the knife anywhere. He couldn't find it anywhere in Aaron Morris's house either. Aaron Morris claimed to know nothing about it. But of course Aaron Morris also claimed he was innocent. Oliver was confident that his guys had found the culprit. But Oliver was also nervous about the missing knife. That night Oliver was drunkenly confessing to me the knife was still missing. To his knowledge, no one on that file had been blackmailed recently, including him, of course. But if anyone ever found that USB flash drive... be disastrous. Yep. The whole thing was pretty fucked. Anyways, that's what Oliver told me. The reason the force came down so decisively on Aaron was probably because they wanted to settle the matter definitively. Meanwhile, Oliver would handle the search for the knife privately. Flash forward a few years, he's kept in touch, said the knife still hasn't shown up. Then this kid who's obviously a fucking kid tries passing off this phony idea on me. 
Turns out this kid's name is Brian Morris, and he's pretty pissed at my part in convicting his dad. I don't really feel bad about any of that. I just did my part, spoke the truth. I did have a reason to feel bad though, and that's because I know and now knew a lot more of the truth and had done pretty much jack shit with it. Anyways, I let him blow off some steam by ranting at me, then I sent him on his way. He swings by a few more times, never for any real point. Our relationships get our relationship gets marginally better. We played a game of darts at some point. And then I stop seeing him for a while. And then one night I'm closing up shop when I hear a noise behind me. I might have been off the force for a while, but my instincts weren't totally shot. I wasn't gonna let a kid completely ambush me. So I turn around just in time to look Brian in the face, which caused him to hesitate from shooting that taser. I was unclear as to what exactly he intended to do, but I knew his expression well. It was that of a man about to do something very reckless and very stupid. I tried to strike up some of the report we had previously had, but he was different. At one point he mentioned how me and my friend Ollie would pay for strangling the justice system. Though he clearly knew more than he did when he, we had previously met. I was unclear how much more, but he knew more. Still, I tried to get a straight answer out of him and he continued to act weird. He talked about how it was right, his right, after everything that had happened. He was saying it more to himself than me. And it was at this point I knew that something wasn't right. This kid was in over his head. On a hunch I asked myself, I, I asked him if somebody had given him the idea for this, whatever this was, if someone was helping him. In response, he shot me with a taser. But before passing out, I got a look at his face and I knew the answer. The fuck? So, fuck, what are you saying? I believe he's implying that the Jade Emperor was not Brian alone. Well, I didn't think that yet. It was only how he reacted when I pressed him about the encounter while he was explaining the rules that I felt something was off. He spoke as if he hadn't even remembered the incident. Hold on a second. Are you saying that voice wasn't Brian? I thought the guy on the screen was Brian. The person on the screen was most certainly Brian. I would recognize that tattoo anywhere. Although, considering the getup he was in... I'm not saying I have all the answers. Didn't then, don't now. But it was definitely suspicious. Something wasn't right. And something wasn't right with the people who were there. The two standout cases being Mouse and Dragon. You two are right. There isn't a good reason for either of you to be there. So I was on the lookout. Then at the end when I saw Dragon dragging Snake away from the group, I had a feeling that was the first move. So impulsive, that one. I already apologized, you fuckwit. How long are you going to be on this? It's just still surprising that you'd believe such a blatant lie. I mean, someone like me, funding a gang like the Scorpions? The Jade Emperor must have been transmitting hypnotic powers through those speakers. Fuck you! Well, my point stands that the person behind us clearly manipulated Dragon into getting into a fight alone with Snake. First things first, I got Bunny to gather everybody up in one spot where people could all see each other. Why did you do that again? Not important right now. Next I ran after you and interrupted the fight. I didn't have time to let things run their course, so I used the taser I found early in the gym to put you both to sleep. We already know this part. I'm being thorough. And stop yelling, I'm standing right there. Anyways, luckily the two of you had already input your actions, so I just dragged you to the nearby side exit in preparation. When the game ended and the neck braces all came unlocked, I did the honor of taking them off for you. Then when I returned, I realized that Mouse, the other person of interest, was gone. I chased after you and was able to catch you just before you walked headfirst into that trap. And thank you for that. Anyways, at this point I was putting two and two together. Dragon, Mouse and possibly Snake were all being targeted. You were brought here to die. For that main reason, alongside a couple of other things, I brought you this little safe house. Keep us safe, right? Yep. And you're so certain this co-conspirator of yours exists? I'm not all so certain. But I'll say this, Mouse, after I knocked you out, I knocked on the door to Brian's base, and I didn't get a response. Huh? Maybe he was playing coy, or maybe the explosion wasn't the thing that killed him. Yep, he was already dead. Doc's words hung heavy in the air. What he was suggesting was true. 
I already knew part of the story, but when he laid it all out like that, I couldn't help but feel we were part of something much larger. I must say, though, it seems like whoever's behind this nefarious plot went through an awful lot of trouble to eliminate the three of us, even if they blundered at the very end. For what purpose would they be so incensed to kill us? I have to imagine it's related to the murder of Amadeus Bowen. I mean, I don't know why exactly, but that seems to be the only real connection between the three of us, right? Yeah, seems to be. I'm less concerned as to why they were trying to kill you three. It's more about the murders you don't commit. Like Jazz or Mahjong for that matter, but I digress. Anyways, why not just execute the whole lot of us? Seems like the way we went about it all was rather inefficient. I fought carefully. I knew the case very well, at least in the abstract. After all, my dad had obsessed a lot about it. He truly believed that Aaron Morris was innocent. I never actually thought he was right, what with all the evidence, but if everything Doc had said, I began to reconsider. Was there something more to this that we had missed? Oh, now you think that mouse. Well, it took you a long time. Not like I said that he was actually innocent like five minutes into the game. Well, so long as Aaron Morris was the only person who could have stolen the Mastercard from Amadeus Bowen's wallet, I suppose it's pointless to worry about such things. I wonder, is that really the case? I'm wondering what? Weren't you the one who gave the testimony to that effect? I did. Like I said then, Amadeus dropped his wallet on the floor at some point. He left and Aaron came back in to get it for him. Aaron could have taken the Mastercard then. However, however, at one point before he dropped his wallet, Amadeus went into the bathroom. He was pretty sloshed at the time. Perhaps someone swiped it from him then. Really? Why wasn't this a bigger deal? Well, he still, held, still had his wallet on him when he left the restroom. The prosecutor argued that while it's possible that in his inebriated state, Amadeus might have been stolen from, however, it was unreasonable to think a pickpocket could have taken the wallet, looked through it, taken the Mastercard specifically, and then put the wallet back in Amadeus' pocket without him noticing, especially considering he just took a piss at a urinal. When you put it that way, it does seem difficult. As you probably know, after going to the bar, Aaron took Amadeus back to their workplace and Amadeus slept in his personal office. The security tapes may have been messed with, but that only extends to the actual day of the murder, so no one came in and stole from him when he was sleeping. Right, right. Yeah, I don't know how much about it, but it seems like Aaron definitely fucking killed Amadeus. And honestly, good for him. Dragon. She actually has a point. Oh? As detestable as violence is as a rule, there are certain situations where they may be morally, morally permissible. Depending on to what extent of Amadeus' crimes Aaron was aware of, specifically if he knew how compromised the police state was, it's reasonable to conclude that murder was the only affordable option. I do not wish to condone murder, however. I find it hard to imagine the punishment matched the crime as it were. Snake was right. From what Doc had told me, Amadeus was a monster, someone who needed to be slayed. He could have sympathy towards the person who killed him. However, someone that atrocious surely attracted powerful enemies. If you viewed the case not as a disgruntled employee lashing out at an abusing boss, but as the assassination of a person who was tantamount to a crime boss, there was suddenly a whole new lens to look at the case through. Far more care, intent and planning could be penned to the killer and there are certainly unresolved mysteries in the case. I think something's wrong with this case. What, you think this Aaron dude's innocent? I don't know, I just think something's wrong. Let me just, for my own sake, I want to try laying things out a bit, laying things out about the case. Is that okay? Shoot. It's not as if we have much better to do. Okay, so it's important to note the geography of the crime scene. The majority of the action took place on the second floor. Walking in from up the stairs, there's generally a, uh, there is a generally accessible bathroom directly to the left. Further on the left is one waiting room, and across from the waiting room is the door to Amadeus' private office. So we have bathroom here, waiting room, Amadeus' private office. Against the wall in the center of the room is the secretary desk. Where she worked? Right. Also along the back wall was the door to a different waiting room, to the right, and the door to a storage closet to the left. Yep, different waiting room, storage closet. I 
If I'm remembering the scene correctly, all the doors had windows that could be seen through. That's how I was able to watch everything unfold, after all. It also might be relevant to note that both guest rooms and the storage closet all had windows. Well, since... did they? Then it's the wrong way around, isn't it? And this is a guest room and this is his private office. Because this has a, these three have windows, this one doesn't. It's probably not relevant, but I still think it's worth mentioning. The windows actually had little architectural slabs, which could in theory be stood on. Wait, you're saying you could walk between these windows? I'm saying it would be very risky, but possible to move between windows. However, the slab outside of the storage closet had broken off a while ago. If the window was open, it'd be possible to maybe move one from one slab to the inside of the storage closet by leaning in against the wall. However, unless you were incredibly athletic like Tiger or Horse Level, it'd be impossible to jump out the storage closet window onto another slab. Since it fell off, it would also probably be impossible to move from the slab outside the window of one waiting room area to the other one, again unless you were as athletic as Tiger or Horse. Uh, be impossible to move from the slab outside the window of one waiting room area to the other one. Why? Which was so, oh, so this was the one that broke off. So this is the storage room. I think this whole thing is like upside down or something like not upside down, but like no, it's all kinds of weird. Like the description doesn't match the image. I don't know which I should rather trust, the image or the description. Hmm. That's a lot of detail for something you claim isn't relevant to the case. Father pursued this line of reasoning a lot when looking into his defense. He thought it could be relevant. However, he was never able to work it into the case, and so it became an, became an irrelevant detail. So, okay, that's the layout. They started with Bowen meeting with a contractor who was doing construction work beside the building. Thinking about it, that was probably Horse. Bowen's secretary, who I guess was Sheep, arrived at some point in the morning as well, early enough to see Horse leave Bowen's office and go down the stairs. The athlete, who I guess would be Tiger, then arrived at the scene. Bowen has a policy of only meeting with people when he felt good and ready, so the secretary directed the athlete to the waiting room to the right. The next person to arrive would be the artist. That's you, right Snake? Correct. I was commissioned to make a sculpture for Mr. Bowen. It was a hollow metal statue of a giant wallowing in despair made from the remains of my past failed sculptures. I quite liked that piece. Though if I remember right, you were carrying the statue with you at the time. Yes, that thing was bigger than me, so moving it was a real pain in the ass. You were told you could drop the statue, and then you were directed to the leftmost waiting room. Indeed. The sheep then proceeded to take my statue, almost drop it, and then move it into the storage room. Most people would start looking on their phones or reading a magazine when directed to wait, but according to you, you did no such thing. Indeed. I was deep in my thoughts that day. When I get in that state, it's almost trance-like. If I'm like that, I can be very simple-minded, forgetting even the most basic of things. So while in thought, I blankly stared out the window. Oh, but don't get me wrong. Just because I wasn't paying attention doesn't mean I would have missed something. Sure, sure. Anyways, then the actor came in the building. Let me guess, Rooster? Presumably. He was also shown to the rightmost waiting room. A bit of time passed until the actor's stomach started acting up. He exited the rightmost waiting room and made for the bathroom. Correct, I saw him exit myself. A bit after that, the secretary went downstairs to the first floor to have breakfast in the break room. Around this point was the earliest the autopsy estimated Bowen could have been killed. But not when he was killed, right? No. I saw the secretary leave and I also had a direct line of view to Amadeus's office. After finally dealing with his stomach problems, the axel left the restroom and returned to the rightmost break room. Then, uh, then the secretary returned from breakfast and sat back down at her desk. This all line up with what you saw, Snake? Indeed. A bit more time passed and this is when Aaron Morris finally comes up the stairs and enters Amadeus' office. Amadeus texted him to meet him in his office that he had something important to tell him. Importantly, Aaron was wearing a big overcoat and was carrying a suitcase. Unlike everyone else present, he had a means of concealing what would be the fatal weapon, as well as the stacks of cash later found missing from Amadeus's safe. 
This is where Aaron's story starts getting nonsensical. He claims that Amadeus remotely fired him, saying that he didn't want to be in the same room as Aaron in case Aaron got violent. According to Aaron, when he walked in the room, Aaron's laptop started to play a message left for him that told him to pack his stuff and leave. Curious, Aaron stormed out the room and complied. This was Aaron's real mistake. He underestimated how far all these cy cyber analysts can vet this stuff. No such video or audio file was found on the laptop. No files had been deleted from the laptop for a while. The Bluetooth speakers the laptop was connected to, which played the message, hadn't been connected to any device other than the laptop. Basically, there's no trace of this message Aaron talks about anywhere, and that's not nothing. Also, it's such a weird fucking lie. I mean, leaving a message in your office to fire somebody? Who's ever heard of some bullshit like that? It doesn't make any sense. Maybe that was the point. Huh? Forget it. Anyways, the important point here is that he claims Amadeus wasn't in the room at this point. Or at least not in the room in a way Aaron could see. Say, when was the last time a reliable source saw Amadeus alive? Would that be Horace? I think Sheep might have talked to him or something. I don't remember the details on that part well enough. I'll have to learn more about that. Anyways, it was at this point that Aaron drove off back to his home. The construction worker Horse saw him leaving. He and some co-workers had been working in the area for a while after all. <laughs> some amount of cash bearing Amadeus' fingerprints would later be found in that car's glove compartment. Next, Amadeus texted Snake, asking him to bring the statue into his office. It was certainly odd. I planned on talking to the man about the piece myself. However, I knew that Amadeus liked to do things his way. I complied and went into the storage compartment. I noticed that Sheep had been kind enough to put the statue atop a piece of cardboard and leave it on a dolly. Wheeling it with the dolly made it much easier to transport the statue, although not as easy as I would have expected. You're saying that this was likely a fake text? That's the going theory. Then hold on, how would Morris have sent it? I mean, he left at this point, right? And the phone was eventually found on Bowen's body? And what's the deal? It turns out Bowen had an app on his phone which let him schedule text to be sent at a later time. An analysis revealed that the app was used on that text. Well, that doesn't look good for Bowen's case. Anyways, I dropped off the statue, dolly and all, in Bowen's office. At this point, I was a little irritated about how I was being treated, so I didn't bother arranging the piece for him. I simply left the building. So at this point, your testimony ends. Incidentally, the autopsy estimates that the latest Bowen could have been killed was about when Snake left. Oh, then perhaps I did this. Hey. Wait a second, couldn't he have totally have done it? The secretary was gone for a good bit, right? Couldn't he have entered Bowen's office at this point? Not possible. Huh? Remember, Snake wasn't the only witness. Tiger was also there, sitting in a place where she could have seen through the door window. She might not have been focused on it all the time, but the way the building was set up, the door to Bowen's office opening would be in full view of the window. She couldn't miss it. In a sense, Snake and Tiger kept each other in check. Tiger couldn't leave the room without Snake seeing her. Snake couldn't enter the office without Tiger seeing him. And no one else could get to the office without both of them acting as witness. A rather elegant maze of vision, wouldn't you say? A real pain in the ass, it sounds like. Anyways, after this a little time passed. Then the actor got fed up with waiting, left the waiting room and stormed into Amadeus's office. The secretary tried to stop him, but he pushed past her. The secretary expected to hear shouting, knowing her boss was not a man who tolerated such disrespect. However, a bit of time passed and nothing happened. Curious, the secretary looked in a room to see the actor twirling around in Bowen's chair. What, so Russo was just poking around the victim's room alone for a bit? Ain't that suspicious? It is odd, might be worth asking about. At the time the actor claimed he was just admiring the room. The secretary kicked him out of the room and at this point the actor left the whole building, fed up. However, at this point the secretary got worried not knowing where Mr. Bowen was. She tried calling his phone but got no response. If she had really listened, she might have heard the phone going off in the safe. After a bit of time, she began to worry where her employer might be. She called 911 about a person who had gone missing. 
Kind of an overreaction at that point, don't you think? Well, she was right to overreact. Anyways, a cop that happened to be nearby was sent to check out the place. That cop was presumably Bunny. The secretary explained the situation to the cop, and in turn, the cop began to search the area. Before too long, he decided to open a rather large and conspicuous safe in Mr. Bowen's room. Inside, he found the body of one Amadeus Bowen, stuffed in his own safe. Some amount of cash had seemingly been moved out of the way to make room. It was at this point the scene was declared a crime scene, and the athlete was asked to leave. Wait, so Tiger was just sitting here the whole time? That traps. Amadeus was found to have been bludgeoned to death with a statue in his office. A statue that would later be found in a river nearby Aaron Morris's house. He was also strangled with a thin wire-like instrument. Coroners actually argued over whether or not this was the thing that killed him and the blow to his head was post-mortem, or if this simply knocked him out. This all just sounds like modus operandi of Tiger. And we also established that Tiger could have gone from one windowsill to uh, Bowen's office, I'm pretty sure, unless some of the disparity between the description and the picture actually made it so that that's not so that that's not possible, but I don't think so. And she would have had to have done that while, um, while Rooster was on the toilet. But as far as I remember, I think Rooster was on the toilet and came back to the waiting room before Aaron Morris entered the building, which would make the whole case strange. Because while I think Aaron Morris might well have stolen the money and realized that Amadeus Bowen had been dead in the safe, he still must have at that point been in the safe because how else would he have gone into there? I think, unless I'm missing part of it and I'm getting something wrong here. 